we again like to introduce our speaker, John Reddy. Uh, he's got a guide service and he fishes a lot of the local lakes, also some of the Lake Michigan tributaries. He also fishes some of the other, like the harbors, uh, a lot of like Lake Geneva, Lake Delavan, a lot of the other inland lakes. And today he's gonna talk a little bit about fishing for lake trout and that and through the ice on Lake Geneva. John? I uh, just want to give you a little um, history on, on myself and my business. I've uh, been in business uh, uh, January of 13 would have been 10 years, so a little over 10 years. Uh, I started my, um, my service as a, a part-time ice fishing venture. I worked in agriculture when I started and um, pretty much eliminated any open water season for me to guide, so it was mainly ice fishing, so that's how I started. And uh, um, I do it pretty much 12 months a year, pretty much uh, you know, start the season out ice fishing, uh, go through spring, all the way through fall. Like a lot of you know right now, the brown trout fish in Milwaukee is like uh, right in the middle of the heart of the season. Um, but I, uh, lake trout fishing through the ice is by far one of my favorite uh, species to target. It's not really a, a numbers game, it's more of a quality um, fishery, but in the last five years, the, uh, the populations and the popularity in, in Geneva fishing for lake trout has grown quite a bit. And um, the Wisconsin DNR has had a very, um, a very well-managed stocking program, and all the fish in Geneva are 100% stocked, and they don't reproduce successfully, as far as we know. Um, so a lot of the fish that we catch um, especially with uh, Doug Wallace, the uh, fishery biologist for Walworth County. I, I connect with him every once in a while, let him know when I'm catching what I'm seeing. And I, I kind of uh, tell other fishermen to do the same, you know, at least shoot them an email or give them a call and say, hey, you know, we caught a 10 pounder, 15 pounder or whatever. Tell them where they caught them. And, you know, they're not really keeping tabs on what people are catching, but it helps manage the, uh, the resource. Um, but the one thing I wanted to, to cover first is, is uh, especially with Geneva, uh, ice safety is very, very important. Uh, being a very deep cold lake, similar to Green Lake up by uh, Oshkosh Ripon, uh, northwest prevailing winds, um, usually the first safe ice is Geneva Bay on the, on the east end. So pretty much the narrows to Geneva Bay. Um, Tom the Narrows is the first area to freeze and uh, just to put you all in uh, kind of uh, relation to where we are on the lake. Uh, the Narrows is where it bottlenecks in the middle, kind of towards Geneva Bay. <coughs> just hold this in half. And Lynn, Lynn Pier or Lynn Road kind of pulls right into the Narrows. And that's probably the number one access point that a lot of lake trout fishermen uh, will go to, mainly because you walk about maybe 100 yards, you're in 70 feet of water. So that's, and this is a major fluke or a pretty much a bottleneck or a narrows area of valley that these fish use and they, they use that as a highway. So a lot of guys, you know, you'll do very well early in that spot. If you can get out there, one of the first guys out there, you'll do well. But I'm kind of going to talk about the, the species itself a little bit, but these fish become very educated, very tight lipped quickly. A lot of them are hooked and missed and lost halfway up and they, they get a little bruised up. So, but that's going to be your first, your first safe bite will pretty much be the narrows east. And you, Geneva Bay is going to be the first one to freeze over, but there aren't too many trout up in here. Usually if we catch trout in Geneva Bay, a lot of guys will catch them on tip-ups fishing pike. They'll catch browns and rainbows up in there, but lakers for the most part are going to be you know, probably, I would say, the Wrigley, some of the Wrigley estates are up here on the north side, pretty much from that side this way. you got to pretty much come into the body of the lake to get into, you know, 60, 70 feet of water, and then it progressively gets deeper as you go further west. <coughs> but I'll get more on the geography in a little bit. Um, but average, on average, we're... Uh, fishing 70 to 90 feet of water. That's my average depth of water. So that requires you to get out in the lake, and that's where I'm talking about safety of the ice. I like to start at least six to eight inches. 
Um, over 90 feet of water, I'm kind of nervous on six inches, especially a guy my size. But um, eight to 10 is better, because if you're, if that ice gets any thinner, you got something to play with. And there's a lot of guys that go out there in four inches, three, four inches, it's, I think it's nuts. But I've had times where I've been out there six, eight inches, and I've been on a four wheeler, and I, usually you'd think the, the clear patches where there's no snow is where it's gonna be safe. But there's been a few times I've gone across those and spider cracks go out and you see your life flash in front of your eyes. So you wanna you wanna be sure of the ice and the thickness spud bar. It's it's worth taking a walk out first, hitting with a spud bar. The rule of thumb with a spud bar, one hit keeps you about an inch, depending on how hard you hit. So if I hit three times and I'm through, I'm calling it a day and going somewhere else. So um Buddy system is important, you know, if you can get a buddy to go with you, especially fishing deep water. Fishing big water like Geneva, there's been a lot of times where I have a handheld GPS I use and um, there's actually been whiteouts out there where, um, you know, it's gotten me back and you get some, um, that lake will really humble you in a hurry on some days, but sometimes your GPS won't even work, it's so bad out there. So be sure to know where you're at and take a buddy with you for safety. Let someone know, you know, where you're going, how long you're gonna be. I always mention, you know, the rogue idiots or the cars out there. You get some people from the city that think it's cool to drive their car, do 360s, whatever, and they'll get lost out there and they'll be pooling right down the middle of the lake. So just kinda keep your eyes and ears open and be prepared to run if you have to. So <laughs> we've had issues out there. That's one of the few lakes in in Walworth County. Um, for, for some reason, they allow car traffic on Geneva. I've never figured that quite out, but, um, but keep an eye on that. Um, now, as far as the lake trout go, um, it's the furthest inland lake in the U.S. as far as I know that have uh, lake trout present and, and they can sustain the resource. Most of the lakes that are south of here are either not deep enough or cold enough to sustain them. So most of the time, um, you know, those fish are living, um, you know, other than when they spawn in the fall, they're gonna be in fairly deep water most of the year. Uh, very slow growth rate. Um, I'll talk a little bit about catch and release. Uh, a lot like we're trying to manage the um, fishery in Milwaukee, we're turning a lot of the bigger browns, bigger lakers back. It takes a long time for them to grow, but they have a long lifespan. They're one of the longest living uh, fish out there. Definitely the top of the food chain. Um, we recently started stocking muskie in Geneva, so they'll probably be battling for the top of the pyramid, but uh, uh, for the most part, if you look at a lake trout, they're just, they look like an eating machine. They're real streamlined, real, um, real aggressive fish. Definitely do not want to lick them when you catch them. But uh, average size, I would say in the last uh, few years, you get a lot of a lot of two three pounders, but the average is probably five to ten, five to twelve pounds. So you got some decent fish in there. <coughs> My personal best guiding is a little over twenty pounds. Um, when we pulled that twenty pounder out of the out of the, out of the hole, I was back in 09. Uh, we caught a few 15, 17, 12s in between there. Um, but that I swore it was a king salmon when we pulled it out. It was so tall and wide. It's just a just a huge fish. But I know there's uh, probably 30 to 40 pounders in there. I, I've seen, I've seen fish uh, on video from divers that probably would blow up the fish that we caught. So there's definitely a big fish potential in Geneva. Um, they're transient fish in a way, but they're they're very territorial. It's a lot different than the Great Lakes where they're following the schools of uh, alewives, you know, and, and, and bait fish. Geneva, they're more relating to um, structure. Uh, your main food source out there is Cisco, of course, and you got the mimic shiners out there. Uh, huge pods of mimic shiners, and they had a huge, huge bumper and um, the bait explosion on Geneva. If you go fish there in the summertime, you'll actually have false bottom when they, when they, they uh, swim underneath the boat. The, the schools of bait fish are so thick out there. So these fish are, are well fed, they have, have more than enough food out there. So essentially what I have here laid out for baits, I'm trying to match the hatch and really I have a huge kind of a myriad of baits here, but 
like I said, they get very tight with very groomed up for, um, you know, a lot of guys um, have caught on to the race and, and chasing lake trout, but I like to keep mixing it up. If they start kind of shying away from a bait, and that's where a Vexar really is handy. You can read the fish mood. If you see them come up, sniff it, and they go away, you know, oh, i got to try a different different profile, different action, different color, something. So um, I'm just trying to match the hatch, trying to, um, you know, get them to trigger, trigger a strike. But I have big baits, I have small baits. There's days I've, I'll finesse these fish. Some days I'll, they'll bring, I can fish very aggressively. Um, but pretty much talking to some old timers out there, they've played up Lakers in the past and they've found, you know, 18 inch pike, um, walleyes in them, other lake trout. So they're, they're getting, they're eating big baits. So you don't want to shy away from using larger baits, larger profile. But most of, uh, most of the time when uh, when I fish Lakers, I'm fishing pretty aggressive. Real similar to how you would uh, vertical jig kings or vertical jigs for browns uh, in Milwaukee. Pretty much a, a rip rip technique and you're <coughs> hitting it on the fall. So when that bait's circling down, that's usually when they take it and they come up you got that cinder block on there. And that's, for the most part, that's, that's how we catch them. But as you get progressively into the season and the fish of uh, either been hooked or caught, released. Uh, I'll start going down to more finesse baits, like the, you know, using a using a bucktail or a hair jig and tipping it with a minnow, and actually almost fishing like you're fishing crappie with a bluegill. You know, we'll, we'll actually um, turn snippers into biters that way too. But my 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 favorite way is doing the uh, the aggressive, you know, um, you know, hard hit like a Mack truck. That's that's what really keeps me coming back. Um, truly an all day species, there's really, I haven't caught many Lakers at night. I have caught them at night, but for the most part, it's an all day affair. So you can't get out till 10, 11 in the morning. I've caught fish at all day, all times of the day. So not really a time sensitive species like walleye or possibly fishing crappie or panfish in the afternoon or in the morning. Uh, definitely a, uh, uh, you know, being deeper water, I think, uh, you know, having that high sun, high, high uh, pressure days definitely does not affect the bite. It usually helps it. Uh, season opens uh, first part of January every year. Um, usually the ice formation is what holds you back from getting out there. I've actually gone out in my boat uh, on a calm day if we don't have any ice yet, and I've caught a lot of them vertical jigging out of boat. So don't rule that out. If you can't get out on the ice, it's very similar to uh, fishing Lake Michigan. The only problem you're dealing with 90 feet of water versus 30. So it's a little bit of a challenge and that's why I mentioned calm day. So if you get a windy day, it's it's tough to know where you're at in the water column. So don't rule that out. If you, if you want to get out and fish for these fish, um, pick a calm day, you know, and uh, definitely, it definitely can work. Um, Kind of what I mentioned before, it's really not a quantity game, it's more of a quality game. I, I compare lake trout fishing to bow hunting. You know, you put a lot of time in, but, you know, doing your homework, um, looking for the right structure, you know, not afraid to change out baits constantly, figure out what they want, uh, know what to look for on the, on the Vexilar. Um, <coughs> you can really um, produce some awesome fish if you put some time in. and. Uh, a numbers game, you're more looking for Great Lakes if you want to get into numbers and fish. But uh, Geneva, you've got uh, a lot of bait, a lot of uh, uh, other factors that are kind of against you, but they're for you because seeing bait is a good thing. You know, there's going to be big fish chasing that bait down. A um, little bit on catch and release. You know, I, I turn a lot of fish back, but when I take clients out, it's entirely up to them. If they want to take one to mount, that's that's that's, that's uh, very acceptable. I just explain the, the importance of uh, letting these fish go and sustaining the resource. I know the DNR stocking has slowed down a bit, so uh, the more these fish take out, the less we'll have to catch. Um, they're very territorial, transient in a way, but for the most part, they hold the structure. Um, when I fish these lakers, I'm fishing 100% of the water column, so I'm looking looking for bait, looking for schools of bait on the Vexlar going through. 
And a lot of times you're just going to be that fluttering green uh, cloud coming through. And usually they're Cisco or the Mimic Shiners. And I've actually had times where um, you can see that bait come through and all of a sudden you see the cloud kind of move a little bit. And then you'll see the minnows up right underneath the hole. So you've got fish chasing these minnows down right up and underneath the ice. So it's pretty cool um, seeing that on the decks a lot. But uh, I've caught many fish. Um, you know, I start on the bottom, I'm creeping my bait up, that fish will follow that bait up 50 feet off the bottom before he gets it. So um, a lot of times we'll see fish come through, we'll reel the bait up real fast to get to that level and they'll hit halfway down. So don't rule out, um, you know, fishing 20, 30 feet down and 100 feet of water. A lot of people will think trout is near bottom. It's not the case <coughs> out there because they're, they're, they can rock it probably 90 feet in a matter of seconds. So they're, they're extremely fast fish. Um, definitely the Vexlar is, it's not, um, it's not a necessity, but it definitely is a tool that's gonna rule out dead water. Um, it's gonna help you tenfold on your success rate. Just know what's going on underneath you. Um, kind of my rule of thumb, if you see a lot of perch on the bottom, if you see a lot of rumbling on the bottom and it doesn't go away, I usually move on until I don't see that. For, Whatever reason, the perch, the little tiny perch like to hug the bottom. And if you see perch, there's really no Lakers in the area. If you don't see much on the bottom, you know there's gotta be a big boy around somewhere. So I usually use the Vexlar. I keep moving until I don't see that crumbling on the bottom. And I, over the years, I've learned my success rate has gone up when I don't see that. Uh, so rule of thumb there, bait good, perch bad. So they, they do eat perch. A lot of these Lakers, when you catch them, they're spitting up little tiny perch. But what that tells me is either there's predators in the area or they're not. So, and I do a lot of run and gun. I don't stay still too long. Um, I keep moving. You know, I, I have certain areas out there I like to fish that are, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this too, but underwater humps and points that hold fish consistently. And then sometimes those fish are gonna be off that structure chasing down bait. So just constantly moving, trying to get a, the big picture on what's going on for that particular day. So what you're looking for are, uh, when you look at a map, uh, this map here, the fishing hotspots is very, very vague. There's, it's, it's, uh, it shows a lot on here, but there's a lot missing. And I actually have a, uh, a Lawrence H2OC, it's a handheld uh, GPS. And I have a lame avionics chip, I think it goes down to, um, I believe an eighth of a mile. So I don't, I can't zoom in real, real far, but it shows so much more than these paper maps do. So it's, it's worth, it's worth its weight in gold for you guys to invest in a handheld GPS, or at least if you have a GPS head in your, in your boat that you can put on your ATV, a lot of guys will do that, they'll switch them back and forth. But just showing the, the tight contours, there's a lot of sunken islands and uh, inside turns that are on here, but there's a lot of them that are not. So it's, it's worth it for you to invest in a GPS chip, especially if you want to take this fishing seriously. Um, it's a huge investment. But what you're looking for, now if, if um, I'm gonna explain kind of what I'm talking about, if I need to kind of sketch out something for you, I'm more than happy to do that. Uh, but sunken humps or islands, a lot of the time you're going to see on a map, you're going to have great gradual contours and those tight contours all come to a point. And there's quite a few uh, sunken islands down in the Fontana side. So there's a lot of them down on the east end. This is Williams Bay here. This is Fontana Bay. There's a lot of sunken islands between Williams Bay and Fontana on the north side. And you'll see that on a, on a GPS chip, what I'm talking about there. Like right up in here, it looks very plain on this map, but when you look on a, on a GPS chip, it's, it's very complex. And there's a lot of those spots that a lot of guys will mark at Christmas trees, so it's gonna rule out a lot of mystery where those are too, because they're, they're frequent, they're spots that are very frequently fished, but there's a lot of valleys and inside turns uh, points under underwater points that are in between all those areas that fish if they get targeted and bruised up bad They'll just move 100 yards 300 yards off those points 
The picture is still there, but it's not on a particular spot. So um, there's a ton of structure for the fish to uh, relate to. But uh, just take a take a moment if you have a GPS chip. What I'll do is you can do this at home. You can sit sit in your boat or if you have your GPS unit. Just take and take time and look at areas, zoom in on areas, and you can actually hit waypoints on those at home ahead of time. So when you get out to the lake, you can find that waypoint, go right to it, and you can kind of expand from there, see where you're at on the map. Quick question. Are yeah. you going to mark them with Christmas trees, or is that on the ice? Yeah, it's on the ice. Yeah. Yeah. Guys are just mowing up Christmas trees and pull them out, so that's always good well after Christmas when they do that. But um, this year, I don't know, we got single digits now for um, you know the next few days and it's supposed to stay fairly cold so I think Geneva Bay may freeze but it's hard to say because we got a little bit of wind we're dealing with so but I'd say um, I wouldn't plan on being able to get out to the lake or spots probably until after Christmas at least at the earliest but I know John Trossen down there he's he gets pretty good tabs on what the ice is doing <coughs> call him I think he'd, he'd be more than happy to tell you whether it's safe. Guys are out there if they're not out there. Um, like I said before, the Narrows, that's probably the number one first spot that guys can access offshore. Um, I actually have a four-wheeler. I like to be able to travel the lake when I guide, especially the more water I have to guide and put my guys on fish. I like, I like having more area to cover. Um, but the Narrows, a lot of the time, you can get out there a lot earlier than you can going west or east. Uh, <clears throat> kind of cover some of the some of the spots here. Geneva Bay, like I talked about, the, the North Shore up in here in the Narrows. This is this is a real real good area. A lot of good structure in here. Crawford's Bar, that's a popular smallmouth spot. Uh, in the summertime, that actually extends out quite a ways and it drops into 75, 90 feet of water. But I'll actually fish the outer, the outer perimeter of Crawford's Bar. Um, that's actually a real good area once the ice is safe enough out there. Uh, Black Point is another really good area. That's one where a lot of guys will fish that, but they have access offshore by somebody, homeowners, whatever, and they'll walk straight out. Because there's a lot of a lot of real unsafe ice between Lynn, Lynn Pier and, and Black Point. We got a lot of uh, a lot of uh, real bad ice between these points. Um, it's just it's just a lot of deep water. A lot of deep water, and you have your you have your northwest winds blowing in here, and it keeps that open. And you have geese. Geese are another problem that keep keep ice off. Um, but Black Point, Crawford's Bar, this is Cisco Bay, Narrows, right there is probably where I catch probably 80% of my lake trout, right in that area. Just first ice you mean? Or? First ice and through the season. It's okay. just because last year was an exception. Last year you can almost pebble the whole lake without a problem. We had enough safe ice. But um, for, for most years, um, if you want to average it out, you're going to have Vista Fish, Geneva Bay, and maybe maybe Fontana. The rest of this is real iffy. And probably the la last ice to freeze is probably right here, Fontana, right out in front. That's, that's the deepest water in the lake right there. But Yerkes Observatory is right about here. That's a good landmark if you're out there. If you got safe ice, right out in front of the observatory, you're right about where a lot of those uh, sunken islands and points and uh, stuff there are <coughs> right there. But you have, I mean, you're limiting a lot of water. I mean, down here it's real shallow, Butler's Bay, Geneva Bay, pretty much pull that out for lake trout. That's, you know, northern pike, walleye, panfish area down this area. The south shore, for the most part, is pretty quiet for me. I, I, don't, I don't fish down there because a lot of the ice down there is pretty, pretty iffy too because you got your winds pushing in here. So that kind of gives you an idea geographically. Uh, I think we're good on the map. We can, I can, if you guys want to come up, uh, more and open the questions after I'm done talking. If you guys want to know something I didn't cover, but 
I'll kind of go through the base. Um, I use I use these for the you know the Browns and the Steelies and in the Milwaukee Harbors. They work real well for lake trout too. Um, but the gulps, the uh, minnows, I like the ripple shads. Even the zoom, the zoom flukes, you know, bass baits work really well too. I like to put them on different types of heads. You get different actions out of different different heads. You know, like the minnow heads, just a minnow head there, just a simple, simple jig, and you got your garter heads. And I don't worry about these baits hanging hanging horizontal because, like I said, a jig in motion. For the most part, when I'm when I'm jigging for these Lakers, I'm pretty much doing like a foot and a half, two foot, just like this. As soon as that line, as soon as that line goes straight again, I hit it again. And right now I'm, I'm waiting. Sometimes that line will all of a sudden go slack early. Like they'll take it on the fall and crank down and set the hook on as soon as you see that. It, is, it isn't always a, a wrap on the line. I'm watching that line the whole time. And I'm just bouncing back and forth, watching the line, watching the vex water, see what's going on. But it's pretty much just a foot and a half, two foot lift, just like that. And this is actually a uh, this is a Thorn Brothers rod. This is I bought this rod probably 15 years ago, and this is probably the thickest rod they have. I like using medium weight rods, but for the most part, I use this. I'll kind of go into what I'm um, using call lures. I like using uh, big baits just to see if there's something in the area. When I'm talking about a call lure, it's like a big like a. This is a Rapala. Rapala rattle bait. I'll drop this thing down. If I don't see anything on the anything on the uh, the vent slot, I'll drop that. That thing's gonna rock it down quick. I'll give it a, sometimes I'll give that like a three quarter foot rip and see if something brushes in. These fish will come in all of a sudden they'll show themselves. Then they'll drop away. Okay, I'll reel that up, then I'll drop another bait down, then I can start working. So I use this mainly for my call lure, call lure rod. It's big enough to handle a lure, big enough to handle a big fish. But I have a garter head here, and then this this is one of my favorites. I like those Northland eyeball jigs. They have that great big prism eye on there. They don't really have a you don't have a darting motion, but I think that big eye on there accounts for more hits than using just a plain garter head for me. Um, and tubes. Tubes, I would say, are probably, at least in the last five years, have probably accounted for most of the fish. You know, it's just, um, they're very effective, they're soft. Um, pretty much when you rip them, they kind of have a big, long, circular motion, real similar to a jig or a pala. But they, they respond to tubes. I use, I use the dark colors some days, but for the most part, I'm using, I'm using whites, pearl whites. And Geneva, you, you can visibility is 20, 30 feet sometimes in the wintertime. So I, I, I stick with natural colors. I don't really go too much off on a tangent from the natural patterns. But, um, you know, there's days where the green pumpkins and kind of a perch color, you know, different colors. Call it, I think they call that Christmas. But uh, a lot of those are going to produce more if that's what they're targeting that particular day. So that's why I talk about not, don't, not being afraid to <coughs> untie and tie on baits, switching them up a little bit. And uh, this is another one. It's a, that's a power bait. It's a, like a holographic middle tube. Those are really good too. Um, and then another one I, I've used too are the, uh, the Havoc grass pigs. It's kind of like a it's got a paddle tail on the back. It's meant for bass, but it works really well for, for trout too. Bigger profile, move some water. Um, and on the jigs, you know, the jig heads they have metallics. I like I like going with the silvers, you know, the chrome silvers, but you know they have different colors: chartreuse, pink, greens, gold. Uh, hair jigs are really, really versatile too. Like I said, that's usually when I start <coughs> finessing the fish, I'll start using hair jigs. Um, you know, the, the ratio of the hair versus the weight of the head, you know, you can control your fall, your fall rate in between jigs, and you can really get technical on hair, but these are handmade. 
can name jigs here. But, um, you know, using a simple crappie jig is good. The only thing you want to watch is that hook. You want to go with a, a jig that's got a fairly stout hook. If you get a, some of these have very, um, I would consider it a crappie minnow hook, very thin wire. You'll straighten those suckers out and get a 12, 15 pounder on those, straighten them right out. So be sure to watch that. Pencil jigs are nice. They work really well too. A lot of these jigs are, have caught a few fish. They're pretty, pretty well aged. So you used to fish them that way, not um, with the minnow or anything? Actually, I was going to get into that. I, I actually, if you can find emerald shiners or Milwaukee shiners, that's by far the best minnow you can use. Mm -hmm. um, kind of over in our area, we had a real challenge getting, getting emerald shiners, so we were stuck to crappie minnows and they, they don't work as well. Um, they just don't have that. They don't look like a mimic shiner at, in Geneva. If you, I've actually netted the shiners out of Geneva and they look just like an emerald shiner. So if you can get those, and they're, you know, two, three, two inches, three inches long. Um, even you can use wax worms on, on tongue lakers on, on larvae too. Um, so spoons, you can, there's so many different spoons. I brought a, a, a part of what I own, but um, for the most part, I like going, you know, these are, um, these are Northland fire eye minnows. I like using the buckshot spoons. They work really well. The buckshots have a rattle in the back, a little bit of noise, but these are like a holographic prism. Um, this is a old smoothie, you know, like a cast master type of deal. I like using a lot of holographic stuff, a lot of, a lot of flash. If you look at lake trout, their eyes are absolutely huge. So they can see pretty well in that low light. Um, and these are a couple slab minnows. These are actually bass for fishing largemouth. But they work really well because they're wide profile. Definitely gets their attention. Big, big Swedish pimples. You know, I'm not afraid to use big stuff. I actually had to order these off of a, uh, I think the surf caster site hard to find these big ones. I actually have a couple of Swedish pimples that are about that big. I'm not afraid to use them. Um, usually on the spoons, I don't tip them with bait. Because usually when I'm working spoons, I'm doing that foot and a half, two foot rip. You do, you know, five, ten of those, the bait, the bait's gone. So, um, usually don't use spoons for finessing. When I finesse, I'll use smaller, smaller tube baits or I'll go down to hair jigs. But for the most part, when I'm using steel, steel or like the rattle baits, it's aggressive. I'm going for that reaction. I'm going for the alphas in the area. That's pretty much what I'm trying to do. Uh, Jigger Rapala is probably one of the number one bite, <coughs> bite producers, but it's going to be your number one um, losing fish bait. For whatever reason, you'll hook up with a fish and you, you can lose a lot of fish halfway up on these suckers. And I, I don't really. And the same thing with walleyes too. I use these for walleyes, and I don't know if the fish rush them and they just they get hooked weird or what, but they account for more pissed off people. <laughs> but they but they work. I mean, they get fish to hit them. But um, but probably my favorite color on the jigging wraps are, are the glow. That that really really does well. I have a they have a glow light to recharge the stuff too. You know that helps. Um, you know, sonars, zip lures, um, cicadas, they all work really well. I like using these for fish finders or call lures too because they, they move a lot of water and make a lot of noise down there. So you'll call in some fish from a pretty good distance with those. That's probably one of my number one, but this one here I pull out of the package. What I would do first on a lot of these baits, look at the hooks. I'd say those hooks are probably too small on that. So I'll switch the hooks all the way, and I like going. I like going with a like the Eagle Claw triple triple uh, triple X or three X hooks. Um, kind of got to you know just go with better treble. It's going to be worth your time to um, switch those out. You see on these on these sonars, I switch those out. Those are pretty good sized hooks for me. Um, yeah, jigging wraps. Uh, Price has gone up on them too. I mean, a lot of these baits, um, price is just creeping on them. 
Uh, so you guys do a little bit of an investment on them. Um, like I said, the bigger dates are definitely alpha, alpha reaction, looking for the big boys in the area. You're gonna catch big fish on big baits, no doubt about it. But uh, definitely don't shy away from using larger baits than you think. Uh, on the tubes, um, a lot of these you'll, you'll notice that on the tube jig heads, the tube jig heads are not gonna be long enough. Sometimes you get a longer shape, but well, what I'll do is, is uh, I'll actually take some split shots and I'll shove them in the head to offset that hook back on the longer tubes. That's one trick of doing that, and then you add a little bit of weight. I found, you know, those lake mat chips are very, very, very accurate. So um, the lake master, I believe, he can zoom in a lot tighter than the Navy Onyx. I know the chip that I have, I think the Navy Onyx chip I have is, uh, I think, an 07 or an 08. And my friend has bought a 2011, and my, my chip shows more than his does, so I'm figuring that out. So um, you gotta experiment with Lake Master. I like the Navy Onyx because they, they have a lot more lakes. Lake Master um, have less, less lakes, but more sometimes more information on them. Um, a little tighter information, so. Is there any uh, furniture mats that are narrow for area? There is. Because I was, you, yep. know, you said about three eighths ounce jig. Mm -hmm. uh, some days you'll notice, some days, um, now we're talking ice fishing, mm -hmm. some days you'll notice your line definitely is moving. I mean, you gotta kinda fine tune that. If you get a day, um, I'm not really sure what causes that. They talk about underwater aquifers that Lake Michigan, sometimes if you get heavy winds, sometimes you can see that effect and it's really weird. But um, if you notice your line going one way or another, sometimes I'm at it where I'm having to have a Bexlar over here and I'm fishing here just to see the bait. So that is very true. So you gotta kind of fine tune your weights based on the day. Are there any times that you ever do use chip ups? Um, if a client wants to learn how to do it, we'll do it. Um, but but I usually talk them out. I always you know, I usually talk them into, hey, we should start doing this. You know, it, it comes down to I, I, I call it a bad case of diet AD, ADD. You know, I, I just I want to keep moving. I want to my my goal is to get fish on the ice, get them fighting the fish. That's what they hired me for. Mm -hmm. But if the guy wants to learn how to do it, then I'm more than happy to go through it. And I, I always. I ask a lot of those questions when a guy hires me. Hey, you know, what do you want to accomplish? What do you want to do? That way I know what to bring and I'm prepared for it. Do you come across a lot of brown trout, red trout, or anything? Not too often. Not too often now, mm -hmm. Chief. When we do, um, when we catch browns and rainbows, it's usually in Geneva Bay and Montana Bay while we're fishing pike on tip ups. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I've actually. I've kind of gotten away from using the traditional boards. A lot of time, even when I'm fishing pike, I do half and half. I do half autos and half boards. Just because the automatics, you know, they, you can actually fight the fish. And it's just, it's actually one of my sponsors too. So I like to use their, I use their products as much as I can. But it's, uh, um, <coughs> for, for the most part, I've caught maybe one or two rainbows out deep since I fish Lakers. For the most part, it's Lake Bluff. And once in a while, you'll catch small ones too with some Lakers. Uh, Smallmouth will go 60, 75 feet of water in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. They'll go where the food is too. How would you typically fish a hump? Uh, usually what I'll do is I'll, I'll actually fish the perimeter of it and the, and the top. I'll just drill, I usually drill a bunch of holes right away around it. And, uh, Not in the top, but on, on the edge? On the top. I'll, I'll kind of, I'll almost be like a spoke, like a tire spoke. Um, I like to make all the noise right away and then let it settle down. I don't like to drill fish, drill fish, drill fish. I like to get them out of the way. Um, they'll even hear that noise down that deep, but for the most part, they, you know, it doesn't shy the fish much, but I'll pop a bunch of holes and I'll have my clients, I'll get them set up and I'll just keep drilling holes. That way we can really cover that area thoroughly. 
And like I said, a lot of these spots will go to, they'll be old homes, I can just pick them over and most of the time they're fish, but, but um, uh, you mean when you get the territorial fish right there all the time? Yep, yep, once in a while. That's why we kind of talk about catching the weeds because a lot of these fish are caught you know, one year to the next or one week to the next. Yeah. But there's, there's a, I saw the numbers for the lake trout. They really, the DNR really doesn't do a boom shot survey on the lake trout. That's why they kind of rely on guides and, you know, you guys to let them know what's being caught so they know if it's working. If it's really working, um, they probably put their energy into it. And um, I know I talked to Welch uh, a few years ago. I, I uh, joined up with a couple smaller ones for a guy. And a lot of guys call Lakers greasers on Geneva. It's the same thing. They're real rich, real darker meat, not the real top of the line um, as far as palatability goes. But the smaller ones aren't bad for smoking. And I flayed one up. It looked like there were gobies in there, but they were actually smoking in the stomach. So a lot of these fish, uh, um, you know, they're going to feed on anything that's down, pretty much swimming down there. You said you drill holes on the top of the hump. Mm -hmm. how, how deep is the top of these, these humps? Some of them are 80, 80 feet. Okay. Um, I know the. When you're fishing the, the shorelines and the breaks, usually it's 45 to 50, and then it drops in. Mm -hmm. um, I usually don't fish the tops of those pumps too often. Usually the, the, the slope or where, pretty much where the wall meets the floor, kind of where it starts to mm -hmm. slope out. And I'll extend out quite a ways. I've caught bigger fish out in no man's land than I had on the structure. At times, it just, it's, uh, when, you, when you look at it, it's like, man, where the hell do I get? But, but, uh, I usually start on the structure and just keep going out and you'll find fish roaming over open water because there's bait roaming out there. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the time these fish will ambush the bait and they'll, they'll hit them up against these edges. And they, use, they use those edges and that's where I believe the narrows is a kind of a hot spot because that bait's moving through there and they're going up the edge of these, mm -hmm. that ballast. So um, these pre predator fish are gonna use that to their advantage. Were to uh, walk up to that table, I mean, if you had it out on the ice and say, "This is my number one bait." Two, two. <laughs> two. I'd probably grab this sucker right away. That's very good. Yeah. yeah. Either that, or I like these big ones, big profile white. I'd probably go with a pearl white too, just like that. <coughs> but it all depends, you know. If I'm, it depends on what I'm seeing on the back shore. If I'm not seeing a thing down there, I'll probably throw. You know, one of these big rattle baits down or a big big blade bait. And just rip it real, like do a four foot rip, you know, about 10 times and then see if something comes in. All of a sudden you see this big red blotch come in and he kind of, because they'll actually, a lot of the time when I'm, I did an outdoor Wisconsin TV show with Judy Nugent one year and I was on camera telling her, okay, this is what you're looking for. And I said, I said there's a fish and then the rod was bent over. And Fish had rushed her bait before we could see it on the back shore, it was that fast. So I said, there it is, and she had the fish before I saw it on the back shore. So these fish are so fast, it's unbelievable. So it's, uh, um, but I, two would probably be number one. If I only could take one bait with me on a day, it'd be a two. Does the type of bottom, mud, sand, gravel here make a difference? For the most part, it's going to be sandy, sandy and silty bottom. That deep water is soft bottom out there for the most part. Uh, the humps definitely are harder bottom. You can definitely see that. On the Vexlar, you can tell what your bottom, um, soft, hard bottom. Soft bottom, you're going to have a more of a signature glow bottom. Hard bottom, it's going to be very narrow, very, very small. Um, out there, you know, you're fishing the break lines, like the north side, it's all gravel, sand, hard bottom, and it kind of drops into this soft and silty. Um, it's not really silty out there, just a softer, sandy bottom. Um, but the humps out there definitely are, are going to be a little harder than the surrounding area. Do the rainbows and groundlings uh, mingle with the lakers? Not really, no. They're kind of different geographic locations and you know the browns and the, and the steelhead are not steelhead but the uh, the rainbows the rainbows and the browns uh, the browns spawn mainly in the fall rainbows are in the spring uh, I, I think uh, for the 
main reason they're up shell, they, they um, you know, mainly the browns were, the browns that I've caught up there have probably been in 30 to 40 feet of water. We've caught rainbows in six feet of water in the winter time. Um, I know one of the biggest rainbows caught on me was caught in Hammond Harbor. I think the guy was fishing crappie for him in the spring when he caught that one. So they, uh, they like these fishermen needing separate trout stands? Yes, yes. Inland, 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 inland trout stands. Yeah. 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 And, and be sure, um, remember that the season is the first part of January. So they want to fish them until that point. Um, and I believe the limit out there is two, two a day. And I think they have to be 17 inches, I believe. Can you tell us about that? that? Yeah, um, well, what do you, uh, uh, do you have a particular question or? No. Okay, well, um, this is an FL-18. Um, there's a lot of different models now. This is, this is probably one of the first, first ones that I, first ones that I bought. Uh, they have a 22, a 20, a 22, and a 28 now. I like all those particular numbers mainly because there's a split screen on them. Uh, the FL-8s, the FL-12s. Um, they all have um, uh, just one screen. It, it, it covers the whole depth. It's hard to show this unless it's in the water. But um, um, do you have any um, public, like uh, catalogs for Best Buy in the store? You might have some okay. catalogs. I can. I'll kind of explain now, but I can kind of explain. It would help me a little more having something in front of me, but. Um, what this represents on the right on the right side of the screen here, you have a lot of numbers on the face, and there's there's this is actually a deep water model, a 300 foot model. I bought this. I used to guide Green Lake a lot, so I wanted a 300 foot a lot, but only 200. But uh, what this on the right side represents the whole water column. If you have a split screen on, it's going to show zero to 70, zero to 60 feet over here. <clears throat> and this side is going to be on the 18 is going to be the bottom six, six feet. So this side is going to show six feet up off the bottom. And if you go with an FL20 or a 28, I believe, like the 28, you can zoom in on different depths. But the FL20, you can do a bottom six or bottom 12 foot. So you can see it zeroes in. You have a bigger picture of what's on the bottom. And where that split screen comes in real handy is if you're fishing crappies or perch on the bottom. For lake trout, to be honest, all you really need to know is the whole water column. Because they, when they show up on here, they're, they're huge. I mean, it's just a red, red, red mark. And the colors on here are going to be green, yellow, and red. Um, the green's going to be a smaller fish or a weak signal. Yellow is stronger. Red is great. It's, it's a big, either a big fish or, your, or it's right below the signal from right below the transducer. So when, I, when I'm using this, I use the whole water column and I'm, I'm reading for bait, I'm reading for any activity. Like I talked about the rumbling on the bottom. When you see it on here, it looks just like boiling water or, you know, looks just like this on the bottom. And what those are are just little tiny perch swimming on the bottom. And when I see that, that's usually when I keep moving. I'm not even bother fishing those spots. But w when I use this, 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 uh, it's almost like driving your car without gas in it. I mean, it's just, you can't go anywhere. So this, uh, this, this Vexilar has accounted for more fish, ice fishing for me, than I can imagine. And, and if you don't have a Vexilar, when I fished when I was in high school, and even before that point, it was, we'd fish lake trout, and you're just, you're, you're trying to imagine, is there even fish here, or am I wasting my time? So when we used to catch Lakers when I was in high school, I think it was short of a miracle because uh, you know all that all that water out there, you have no <coughs> idea what's going on, and this actually helps read if you have fish below you, and it helps read fish mood. So if if you see a fish coming on your bait and he shies away, you know I got to do something different. Uh, you know you got fish, so you have a confidence, you have confidence, and you have um, you know it's telling you what's going on down there. So it's a huge tool. Any, any other question? Or? I, I might think they have to have to get the hook. Yeah, yeah you have to. Um, an on the ice tutorial is really important, but if you go to my 
My, uh, if you're online, if you go to my YouTube channel, I actually go through some best snark tutorial on there. It was mainly I was fishing bluegill, but it gives you an idea on what you're what you're doing. So what did they run? What's that? How much did they? Um, I, I know when I bought this one, it was about uh, 300. Um, I know a lot of the upper one. You're looking 500 for an upper upper level one, but mm -hmm. at 18, I think you can still get into one for around 300, 350, something like that. I'm not sure, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I have two 18s and 120. By this point, I was hoping I'd have about 12 of them, but they're a little bit of an investment. So, and if you go on eBay, they're usually $20 less than a new one. So they hold their value. You would be blinding it up at these rocks. Yes, especially when you're fishing in deep water like Geneva. You know, even if, if, you're, if you need to buy a GPS or a Vexilar, Vexilar hands down. That's number one. If, if you're gonna buy one or the other, um, Especially when you're starting out, if you go to Lynn, if you go to Lynn, the Lynn Township boat launch, and you walk straight out, just walk straight out to the Mark 70 Creek, and you can move around from there. And you'll see there's actually a lot of guys out there. So, and I like to, one thing I didn't talk about is you want to give each other space too. You don't want to fish too close to guys, especially you know pan fish is not, it's it's not like this, but a lot of these fish are going to run laterally too. They're going to run their line out like this. So. You want to give yourself space, and that's another reason why I don't fish wide bait a lot because you got those other lines you got to worry about. And Wisconsin law, if you can't get to it quick enough, you're breaking the law. So you'd almost have to have these pick ups, you know, 100 yards one way or another just to give yourself space. Um, and a lot of the time when I take guys out, I got a pretty good sized group, I got two in a shack. It's important if one guy hooks up, the other guy burn his bait up as quick as he can to get out of the way. Um, these fish just go ape shit once they're hooked. So, um, so giving yourself some room and some space because these fish really like to move around when they're fighting. How's the extra pick up here at the upper? It's actually one of the healthiest in Wisconsin. I was told um, the way they count system populations, they drop this big weight with a, a vertical net and they leave it out there for a certain amount of time and they say Geneva hands down is one of the best populations in the state. Even over a lot of the popular musky lakes up north that have Cisco base. So we got a really good population out there. I, I've actually caught Cisco 18 inches long out there. You know, Dell Troll Lakers in the summer tie with downriggers too, with spoons. You know some of what you would do on Lake Michigan with dodges and flies. I use like I like using peanut flies, smaller flies, using like a double O, moocher, like a moocher, going smaller, smaller on the on the rigs. But uh, you'll catch Cisco, snag them. Sometimes they'll hit them. Um, but I know a lot of guys have tried to cook them up and they have grubs in them, so they got to be. It's not really like white fish. I've had a few guys call me and they say they want to fish Cisco because they can't get the green main like they did. Apples and oranges, not the same. But for bait, excuse me, for bait wise, on Green Lake, uh, anything over, I believe, 100 feet, we couldn't use live bait, so we use a lot of cut bait up there. So we'd actually catch perch and make steaks out of them, and cook the steaks on. And I'll actually do that with Cisco's. You know, every once in a while, the guy wants to learn how to fish live or dead bait, I'll show him that stuff. And that's, if you aren't going to put something on a, on a spoon, just Catch a few small perch, cut them into you know quarters, thirds, and put a little. Because when you put the steak on there, you stick this through the backbone, and you have the two sides. They're like two little flappers. You can hook that on. That's actually how we used to fish them on a green lake. So if you want to sweeten the spoon up a little bit, that's way more durable than like a minnow head, because you're sticking it right through the spine of the the uh, meat. That's, that's another good good question. You don't fish. You don't see any walleye during the day. Not too often. Um, walleyes, for the most part, are maybe in that 30 to 40 foot range. Geneva's got such a. Um, I'm part of the walleyes for tomorrow, and we we actually ran a successful um, stocking um, a hatchery this year and last year. Th this year more so than last year. Uh, so we're working to build the walleye population. It's just it's it's very very small right there uh, as far as walleye numbers go. But um, I would say in the next five to seven years, you'll probably see more. 
but usually we're fishing deeper than they'll be. They'll be 30 to 40, 30, 35 to 45 feet in the water. Um, and then as far as walleyes go, fishing at night, um, that 12 to 15 foot range on the big flats, it's usually where the fish go. Narrows is no, the northern fishing. Mm -hmm. Does that get a lot of northern? Yeah, uh, not so much out deep. Northern's going to be at the same kind of depth, 12 to 15 during the day. Mm -hmm. We've caught them as deep as 35 feet, but I haven't caught many past 50 foot usually in the wintertime. Wintertime, they're going to be deep. Um, usually when you see the pike deep, you're, you know, usually when the thermal climb is set up until uh, turnover, that's usually where you'll find them deep. Usually by the time we have ice, the, wa the water's not stratified anymore, really. And uh, for the most, most of the time, they're going to be up hunting down crappies and bluegills and all the canned fish. Uh, uh, do you actually keep the pike fish out there because the water's so thick? Yeah, uh, deep water you can't, but um, you know when we're fishing crappies, bluegill, perch, you can actually sight yeah. fish. You know, 12 feet of water, you can count stones right. down. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it's pretty clear. But safety number one. That's you know I, I'm a I'm a captain before I'm a fishing guide, and I, 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 safety is the utmost importance. Um, um, it, it it frustrates the hell out of me when I know the fish are biting, but I can't get out there. You can see where you want to be, but you can't get there. And uh, the worst scenario we have is when you have the launches are froze over, but the middle of the waist open. Unless you got a hover hovercraft or a float boat, you can't get there. So, but uh, it's kind of a waiting game, you know. Based on what we're seeing now, I hope this kind of continues into the winter. But it's hard to say. <coughs> Any other questions? Local guys there. Uh, there there's a trip. few. There's a few. Oh, what's that? Any local guys there? Oh, um, I haven't used shrimp much. Um, it, you know, it might be worth a try. Might be worth a try. Yeah, yeah, might be worth a try. Um, but for the most part, when I, when I, over the years I've filleted fish, I always cut the guts open. I mean, it's just something I do. Every fish I, I fillet, I want to see what he's eating. And it's usually small, small perch, mimic shiners. Uh, I've never seen the northern pike or the walleyes in them. But I've been told they hit fish that big. I mean, they're a predator. Um, but for the most, most of the time, it's sculpins, perch, mimic shiners. Once in a while, you'll see, you know, a bluegill in them. But um, you know, we don't have shrimp naturally there, but it's it's got that uh, instinct. Instinct, yeah. Instinct. Smell. It's got strong oils in it, so um, I wouldn't rule it out. So if the, if the east wind's why would the fish move away from the perch if you can see the, the perch? That tells me if they're there or not. If I've seen a bunch of perch and they're comfortable and they're not moving, then oh, maybe okay. they're not much there. Okay. So it's just... Nothing's chasing them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's like, you know, the cat's away, the mice will play. Yeah. Uh, so if I'm not seeing much down there, I'm thinking, well, there might, there might be something here. So eliminate the dead water. Yeah, um, usually you want to carry a bottle of water with you. Just fill a bottle of water and, and pour it on the ice. You need a little bit of moisture to pour it to work. Oh, okay. Yeah, but if you have the thicker the ice you have or the, the milkier the ice you have, it works, it's not going to work. Clear ice will work good. But if you get any kind of color to the ice or if you've had thaw, snow freeze, thaw, snow freeze, and you get that milky, it doesn't work as well. But if you got three, four inches of clear ice, it's just like a drill of hole. 